I bet you've had the same experience as me many times over when you are looking for something that you seem to have misplaced. Might be your car keys, might be your wallet. Worst of all, when it's a bank card and you can't find it and you're wondering, has somebody else got it and they can use that pay wave without your passcode, right? How many little purchases are going to be racked up before you finally get to block the card? It's a very, it's a very, it gives you that hollow feeling in your stomach when you lose something you desperately need, not to mention the stress and the anguish that it causes because you might be on the clock, right? I often facetiously say to my children when they come to me and they tell me, Dad, I can't find this thing that I've lost. I've looked everywhere. I don't know where it is. I say to them, there is one place you haven't looked. And they look at me with those hopeful eyes of expectation like the wisdom of Dad is going to solve their problem. And I say to them, the one place where you left it. <laughs> and you know, that, that sort of facetious reaction to my children is a reflection because I know, I know that feeling and I know that frustration, right? Well, Jesus, Jesus tells us a parable in Luke chapter 15 from verse 1. It's a parable about the heart, Father's heart, about God's mind towards the lost, towards this lost planet, towards lost humanity. And it goes like this. It, of course, is a story that is told in a particular historical context. And the first two verses of the, of the, of the beginning of the parable sets the scene for the story. And it goes like this. All the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, I guess, I guess what you have here is two, uh, one crowd made up of two parts, right? You've got the religious crowd, the scribes and the Pharisees, those who apparently are close to God, those who apparently represent God, those who apparently teach in behalf of God, those who apparently represent everything that's righteous and good. And then you've got another class, which are called the tax gatherers and the sinners. Now, I might have mentioned to you before that tax gatherers, of course, had a special place of dislike in the Jewish mindset because the tax gatherers were often Jewish people who were serving the Roman uh, imperial forces. And of course, they were essentially considered sellouts to the occupying hosts of the promised land, which the Jews thought belonged to them. So it's like you had sinners, they were low. But tax collectors, they were, they were beyond help, right? They were the, the lost of the lost, absolute reprobates in the minds of the Jewish people. And so the Pharisees and the scribes did not identify with sinners, and they did not identify with tax gatherers, although they were of the same nationality, and although they, they, they should have understood that they were sinners at heart, just like these other people, they saw them as very different, and they saw themselves as those of whom God approved. And so when this religious crowd sees Jesus, this up and coming young rabbi, if you like, this, this man who's gained this popular ascendancy, you know, if he was today in, this, in, in social media um, terms, he would be called an influencer, right? Someone with a great following, someone with a, with, with a million views and with a thousand likes and all of that kind of thing all by this crowd that the religious people didn't identify with, uh, didn't have any hope for, and didn't want anything to do with, they kind of looked at this Jesus and said, well, if, if you are everything you claim to be, and everything people are making you out to be, as a great teacher sent from heaven, you would realize that these are not the people you want to hang around with. These are not the people who have any hope. Why are you not siding with us, Jesus? And in response to this, Jesus tells a story that reveals the true heart of the Father, the, the true mind towards those who are the so-called sinners and tax collectors. And it is the story of a, of a shepherd who has lost a sheep. The sheep has gone missing. And so the story goes like this. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Now, if you think about this, sheep were not so much pets in those days. Sheep, like for farmers today, it was about economy, it was about money, it was about value, right? The greater the herd, the richer you were, the greater the herd, the, the, the more secure your financial standing and your position. And of course, Jesus is talking to a group of people who are of an agrarian orientation, farmers and the like in the crowd, and, and they get this. The moment Jesus says to them, who of you has a flock of a hundred sheep and loses one and will not go after that one sheep? Sheep. Well, there's no one in that crowd that would leave that one lost sheep. 
of course they would go after that sheep. It meant financial loss for them. And, and you might get away with it this once, but if that was your attitude towards the sheep, that every time you lost one, you didn't bother about it, you didn't go after it, where would that leave you economically? <laughs> you know, it's a surefire way to just watch your bank account drain. So sheep here represent money, they represent economy, and to the agrarian culture of the day, they understood the value of the sheep in monetary sense. So Jesus appeals to what we know as human beings, right? Our need to survive. He appeals to the sense of, of economic value, that we do not want to suffer economic loss. Now, that's not the way God sees us. We are not an economic proposition for him, but he appeals to this in humanity. And he says, you can understand the concept of value. Now, I want you to think that the heavenly father sees every one of his sons and daughters, every one of the worlds that he's created out there as of value to him. We are his flesh and we are his blood. We are his creation, sons and daughters. This is what the story of the lost sheep to an agrarian society is supposed to teach about the, the orientation of the father's heart towards the lost. There is a sharp contra contrast here between the, the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people that are supposedly representing God and his outlook upon this world, and Jesus who is what God is in human flesh, who, who has come from heaven to seek the lost, right? Just like the shepherd has gone out to the, into, the, into the dark of night to find his one lost sheep, Jesus has left the courts of heaven above, left the 99 worlds out there, so to speak, that he has created, the angels in heaven, He's left them in that safe place and he's come down here at great risk and peril to his own life. Because when the shepherd goes out into the dark of night, when he goes out searching for that sheep, he doesn't know how long it's going to take. He doesn't know where he's going to find it. He doesn't know what dangers he's going to encounter. He doesn't know where the wild animals are or what's going to sneak up upon him. He doesn't know what the weather's going to do and whether it's going to become dark and stormy and dangerous. He doesn't know. All he does know is that his love for that sheep, his valuing of that sheep, compels him to go forward and find that one lost sheep. And so this is the story of Jesus. The one who's telling this parable is the good shepherd who has come looking for humanity. And you know what? We can understand this parable. We can understand this parable in at least two ways. Number one, the individuals that make up this world, the you's and the me's, right? If there was just one of us that was lost, would Jesus have said, hey, there's only one human being lost. We've got these other seven billion on planet Earth. Let's just be content with that. The picture here is that even one loss is too much for the heart of God to bear. And he would have laid down his life for that one. And then the second way we understand this, as I've already alluded to, is this one world, this one lost planet, compared with all of God has created out there. He could have said, you know what, let's just write that one off. We all know that in business, right? We all know that in business, you've got to accept a few losses. You've got to write off a few bad debts. Maybe that's what God should have done with this world. But no, it's not good enough. This planet stolen away by humanity exercising their freedom of choice, listening to the deceiver, uh, giving their loyalty and their relational connectedness to another. Jesus says, no, I'm, I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to just walk away from them, though they've chosen it. I don't think they fully comprehend what they've gotten themselves into. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to search for them. I will not give up on them. I will do everything I can. And the very, the nth degree of love, the, the point beyond which you cannot go any further is when you have died for the one that you love. That is the story of the cross. The cross is the means and the legal justification, the way in which the good shepherd seeks to win back the lost sheep. Now, let me just remind you as well, to the Pharisees, to the Pharisees, you needed to repent before you come to God. You needed, to, you needed to realize that, that the way you're living is wrong and you needed to give it up. You needed to turn away from it. Once you had turned away from it, then you came to God. The, this parable tells us that's not how salvation works. 
You have no power in your heart to change you. You have no power in your life to, to, that, that belongs to you intrinsically to fix your life and to turn it back to God. No, this, this parable tells us exactly the opposite. God doesn't expect you to repent to receive His love. He shows you His love to awaken repentance. That sheep is as lost as lost can be. It is out there at the, at the mercy of the elements, at the mercy of the predators, and it is only the shepherd who can go searching for it, only the shepherd who can rescue it. That sheep does not find its own way back. It does not return through a circuitous route around the other side of the hill. That sheep is lost. It doesn't know up from down, left from right, north from south. It is completely disoriented. It has no hope of finding its way back to the herd, back to the good shepherd. So the shepherd takes initiative. The shepherd goes looking for the good sheep, or, or the lost sheep, I should say. The shepherd is, is besotted, in love with, sees the value of the sheep and goes out searching because that sheep cannot bring itself back. The Pharisees misunderstood the heart of God and they misunderstood what it took to come back into relationship with God. You did not make yourself right. You did not turn from your sin in order to be received by Jesus. Instead, Jesus reveals himself and draws you to himself. That inkling you feel in your heart, that first desire, that awakening in your mind where you go, there must be something better. There's something that's just, this, this isn't satisfying. This world has got to be more. That sense of, that, that is the wooing of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit upon your heart. That is the beckoning call of God to you. You. That is the beginning of a journey. If you will yield to that and if you will listen to that, if you will, if you will as, as it were, cooperate with that first inkling, you will find yourself step by step being rescued by the Good Shepherd. It's always His initiative. It's always His heart that compels Him to go out in search of the lost. It is always the character of God that draws us out of this world and out of the sin of this world, out of the brokenness of this world. It is always the compassion and the mercy of God that offers us the terms of peace. And it is because He has taken the penalty of sin upon Himself that we can be saved. Because if that penalty of sin had to be paid by ourselves, there would be nothing left of us to be saved. We would be all consumed, right? Like what happened to Jesus on the cross. Death, utter complete death would be ours for the wages of sin is death. We are the lost sheep individually and collectively as a race. This planet is the lost sheep that Jesus has come to save. He's not willing to accept even one loss. So he does everything in his power. It says here in verse 5, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. I want you to notice this. <laughs> Think about this. When I, when I lose something, I become impatient. When I go on the search of the house, you can, you can feel the temperature rising in my, in my bloodstream, the blood pressure, right? I just, I, I, I've got better things to do than to be looking for this lost thing. I need this thing, but I am so frustrated by it, right? When I find it, yes, I'm relieved, but I'm also sometimes, to be honest, a little bit ticked off, especially if I feel like somebody else lost something that is mine, you know? They didn't put it away. I want you to see the picture of God here. When he finds that sheep, he doesn't take his shepherd's crook and give it a good beating to say, Oi, what have you done? You've wasted my time. I could have been doing something better. What is the matter with you, you stupid sheep? Now, to make sure you never do this again, whack, 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 right? That is not the picture you have here. The good shepherd rejoices. He is happy that he has found his sheep. The toil of the night is forgotten. The risk that he has taken is forgotten and swallowed up in the sense of it was all worth it. Thank God I found my sheep is the attitude. Just so joyful that the sheep is now safe. And then not only does he rejoice, but he puts it on his shoulders and carries it home. He lets this sheep ride piggyback on his shoulders to take it home. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the character of God? That's how you and I are saved, my friend. That is how it happens. We are not, he doesn't make us walk home in disgrace, the walk of shame. No, 
He puts us on his shoulders. Do you see the compassion, the tenderheartedness, the joy, the attitude of God towards the sinner? He is not a harsh, stern, unforgiving God like the scribes and the Pharisees portrayed him to be. He was this forgiving, compassionate God, willing to go out and risk all and then is satisfied with that risk when he finds it. So satisfied that he parties in his own heart. He, he puts it on his shoulder and he takes it home tenderly and compassionately, knowing that the sheep is worn out. It is damaged by its waywardness. It, it, it doesn't have the strength to get home by itself. It is the picture of absolute sufficiency on the part of the shepherd and absolute surrender and compliance on the part of the sheep. This is how we are saved, by trusting in the character of God, by trusting in the sufficiency of God, by trusting in the merits of our Savior Jesus Christ. Imagine the sheep gets found and then he says, put me down, I want to walk by myself. No, the sheep is as grateful as the shepherd is to have found it, so the sheep is grateful to have been found and all it wants to do is rest peacefully on the shoulders of the shepherd and let the shepherd use his own strength and his own energy to carry the sheep home. There's no, there's no, oh, thank you for finding me. Now I'll prove that, I'll, that I was worthwhile. I'll walk faithfully by your side. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll go next to you. I'll, there's, none of that, there's none of that thank you, but now, I will, now I'll do it in my own strength. Instead, there is this willingness to simply rest on the shoulders of the shepherd who has found it. And this is the great need that you and I have. This is the condition of our salvation. It is literally that we would trust and rest in the merits, the strength, and the provision of the Good Shepherd. It would be an insult to him after he had gone to that great effort, that great length to do the rescuing for the sheep to be ungrateful and say, thank you, but I'll actually do it my way. Thank you, yes, I'll, I'll take your guidance, I'll, I'll follow you, but, but I'm going to do it in my own strength. No, he knows that the sheep is lost and helpless. And so he puts it on his shoulders and carries it home. This is the picture of what you and I and how you and I need to trust in the Savior who has provided every resource for our redemption. Do not think that we need to make it up to him by our good works and our efforts and our, all the rest of it. No, you trust in him. You rely upon him. You let his sufficiency carry you. This is a picture of grace. This is a picture of, of, of the sheep having faith in the shepherd to carry it home. By grace, through faith, we are saved. I remember, I remember a time uh, in my early Christian experience. I had this great conversion experience. I'd come to the Lord. I, I, or I was involved in the family of God. I'd been asked to serve in the church of God in a position of trust. And then I passed through a season after about a year or two of walking uh, of walking with the Lord, I passed through this very dark season and I, I became disoriented and I became, I, I, I kind of went back to what I knew before. I, I went on a drug binge. I was still coming to church and I was coming to church high actually and I was in this position of trust serving in the church and I knew that I shouldn't and I knew that it was despicable and I knew that it was dirty and I knew that, I knew that but, but I was in this dark, out of control place. And one day, a friend of mine who had been overseas doing some mission work arrived home. And, uh, and there I was at church. I was there for a, uh, for a worship service. And I was hanging out with my mates. And I was high on drugs and all that kind of thing. And, and this friend of mine walked up, uh, up to me, put out his hand. He shook my hand. He said, hey, Adrian, so good to see you. And then I saw that look of recognition. You know, like when two drug addicts connect eyes and we know exactly what's going on with each other, right? This person had come out of that lifestyle and, and I had come out of that lifestyle and I had this lapse and this falling back. And, uh, and I knew when he said to me, when he said to me, hey, why don't you come around tomorrow for lunch? I just knew what that meant. I knew that he knew and he was going to tell me that he knew and that from there there was going to be consequences and there's going to all sorts of things were going to unfold. And I was a little angry with God at that point, not over this event, but over some other things. That was what this dark patch of my Christian experience had been about. And, 
I was in this, and I was just, I was just hoping that when I got there the next day, he was going to lay it on thick because I was ready. That was going to be my out. That was going to be when, when he just came at me. I was gonna, I was just going to go. That is why. That is why I'm done with this. That is why I'm done with church. That is why I'm done with this Christianity thing, you know. And and I was gonna. And so anyway, I showed up for lunch. I, I wasn't going to shy away from it, right? And and I and I showed up for lunch. And we sat around in the house for a little while. And his wife was graciously making us lunch in the kitchen. And we were having this little chit chat. And then he said to me, "Hey, Adrian, let's go for a walk." I knew this was it. You know, we were going to leave the house. We we're going to get away from his children and his wife. And and this was going to be the moment. So I said, okay, yep, let's go. And so we go out on this little walk, right? And we're walking out through this field. And the, and the exact opposite of what I had pictured in my mind, and I must say, I, I had only pictured it because I hadn't actually really thought of the character of this friend of mine, right? I had, I had pictured it because it was what I wanted, and I had pictured that it was going to go down in a nasty way because I knew I deserved it. In my heart of hearts, I knew, I mean, I'd come out of the life, I'd been saved by grace, I'd, I'd been on this journey, I'd been, uh, I'd been called into ministry, there were all these good things happening, and then I'd gone and done the stupid thing, and my own guilt, and my own shame, and my own everything meant that I just, I knew that I deserved this, and so, I had pictured that this was going to happen because it's what I deserved. And I would have been right. It would have been what I deserved. But this friend of mine, he, he took this very gentle approach and he just said to me, Adrian, you know, last night when I looked into your eyes at church, I don't know what it is, but, and I think he did know what it is, but he said, I don't know what it is, but something had changed. And then he proceeded to tell me his own story of how the grace of God had touched his life. And despite that, how he had sometimes fallen back, but always the grace of God had been there for him. You know, instead of the response of judgment, instead of the response which I knew I deserved, this friend of mine shared with me the heart of God and his own heart and his own compassion so that in a very tangible way through this human being, I saw and I felt the heart of God. From that day, that was the last time after that, I was done with that way of life, with that going back to that place. Because once again, like my early conversion experience, God had touched my heart, reconverted it, reoriented it, and had melted away the sense of anger that I had for Him, resentment that I had towards Him over some losses and some things that had happened in my life. And I think to myself, isn't that the picture of the Good Shepherd? Isn't that the story that Jesus was trying to convey here? You know, just the other day, I heard a story of some friends of mine, they were driving downtown. And as they were driving through town, they saw somebody in a wheelchair. And, and they, th th this individual was going across the road in front of the traffic light. And then they turned and they were going to go up this really steep hill. Like, I mean, I know this hill. This hill is a steep hill. I don't even want to walk up this hill. It's steep. It's, you know, it's, it's a decent hill. It's the kind of hill that when you, when you go down and you see the barber shop on the left-hand side of the road, the, the hill is so steep that the seats that are sta standing outside the barber shop the one side of the legs are cut off shorter so that the other side is longer to keep the seat level, right? It's that kind of steep hill. And this, this woman in a, in a normal wheelchair is trying to get up this hill, pushing it. And so these friends of mine decide this isn't right. And so they pull over the car around the corner. Uh, the gentleman jumps out of the car. He runs back towards where this lady is and tries to give her a push up the hill. At which point this lady refuses the help. I mean, this is a steep hill. She is going to struggle to get up this hill. She has this offer of, of strength and of compassion to just help her over the steepness of the hill and set her on her way. But she says, I don't want your help. Thank you very much. I must do this by myself. And I don't think it was that she was ungrateful for the offer. It was just that she felt like she needed to be independent. She felt like she needed to do this for herself and by herself. And while I don't have too much of a problem with that in the physical sense, <laughs> when that is our attitude in the spiritual sense, that we don't want help, that we think we have to do it by ourselves, that we think we must have some kind of independence, that, that somehow it's about our pride and our individuality, that is a dangerous spiritual recipe 
for eternal loss. My friend that day, when he confronted me, did so in a gracious and a kind way. And I needed to make a, a choice as to whether I was going to yield my pride, yield my anger, yield my frustration, or whether I was going to push ahead up the steep hill in a sense, with a sense of independence and self-righteousness. How is it for you today? Every one of us is going to face that choice, not once, not twice, every day of our lives. Will we yield to the goodness of God? Will we trust in the sufficiency of the Savior? Or will we do it our own way? It says here in verse 6, When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And Jesus goes on in verse 7 to say, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You want to set off a party in heaven? Then submit to the grace of God. Let go of your self-sufficiency. Let go of your pride and simply accept the gift that God has given you because without that you have no hope. Hear me today. There, there is no self-help gospel of salvation. There is only a divine help gospel of salvation. You and I need to trust in it. And when we do, when we surrender our hearts, when we, when, when we, when we let the, the love of God melt our hearts and turn us away from that broken way of living, there is rejoicing in heaven over you. And Jesus says this to the scribes and the Pharisees because they thought they were right. They thought they were okay. And Jesus says, there ain't no rejoicing over you. As long as you stay in this state of pride, the state of arrogance, the state of separation, the state of I don't identify with these people who recognize their need. As long as you stay in this place of relying on your own righteousness and your own religiosity or maybe your lack of religiosity, right? Uh, as long as you stay in this place where you're trusting in your own efforts, your own merits, there is no rejoicing over you in heaven because you're still in a state of being lost. But when you surrender, the heart of God is made glad. Every unfallen intelligence in the universe rejoices because it means you're coming home for eternity. And one day you're going to meet your brothers and your sisters from, from, from all these unfallen worlds that God has made. All the angels of heaven. And they're looking forward to your coming home. They want you there. Do you want to be there? And you know, I think that everybody... Every one of us that are, are like this lost sheep that have been found, that comes home. That, what, what Jesus is doing is not only picturing the heart of God for the, for the lost sheep, but he's also calling us to, to ask of him that he would give us the same heart. That in this life of probation, in this life of decision making, in this life down here, which is oftentimes cut short, that is, that is so short, even if you do, do live the full 70, 80 or 90 years, maybe 100 if you're lucky, in this short life that we would devote ourselves to the same acts of love, of service, of reaching out, of seeking those lost sheep. Because we as a lost sheep know what it is like to be in that dark, dangerous, predator rich environment. We know what it's like to be the place thing of the enemy. We know what it's like to suffer with addictions and with anger and with rage and with, 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 with sexual uh, aberrances and with all sorts of things that, that seem so enticing and yet which destroy our lives. We know we have been there, but we have been rescued. So number one on my list of appeal to you today is yield, yield to the calling voice of God. Respond to his efforts to reach out to you. Give him your heart. Let him carry you on his shoulders. Give up your self-sufficiency and your pride. Let the love of God warm you. And in that experience with him, gradually over time, turn you away from your brokenness. Don't think that your, that your, your, your being made right with God depends on your efforts to make right with him or to turn away from your sin. Come to him as you are. Don't let the enemy use that as a roadblock, that you must first get yourself right before you can approach him. No, the shepherd is seeking for you. He is looking for you. And then the second element of my appeal to you today is very simply that when you yield, ask God to give you his heart for those of your fellow flock who are still lost 
out there needing your grace, your compassion, that perhaps you might be that voice like my friend Brian was to me all those years ago at a critical juncture where I actually needed compassion. I expected judgment, but I needed compassion. How many people do you meet, perhaps even if you do attend a church fellowship or, or walking down the street who seem rough and careless in their living? And you, you might look at them and see no hope, but maybe it's in this very moment where that, those words of compassion, those acts of compassion, might turn that heart from that path they're on simply because you chose to show them the heart of God through your body, through your words, through your eyes, through your hands. I invite you to receive the grace of God and I invite you to be the grace of God to those around you because everyone born into the kingdom is born as a missionary in that kingdom. We receive Jesus, we come to Jesus, that we might go with Jesus and for Jesus, that we might become his hands and his feet, that we might be his heart, that we might speak his words. Remember, <laughs> you might have looked hopeless to someone at some point in time. Maybe you even seemed hopeless to yourself. But the grace of God can and will reach you, and the grace of God can and reach can and will reach the worst of what we might think is out there. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus is looking for you, friend. Jesus is searching for you. The enemy is trying to tell you that, that you're too rotten, you're too far gone, you've done too many things, you, there's no hope for you. That is a lie. The shepherd came into this world to find you. He laid down his life to, to, to redeem you. You are his because he created you. You are his because he purchased you back through redemption. Both by creation and redemption, you belong to him. You are his kin. You are his child and he loves you. And there ain't no damages done to you through the experience of sin, either what others have done to you or what you have chosen to inflict upon yourself by your own choices. There is no damages that have been done to you that, that, that he cannot heal, that he cannot restore, that he cannot make right. And he loves you in your darkness, in your brokenness, and in the pit of sin. He sees you and he loves you and he has searched for you and he is calling to you. Only one thing you need to do, call out to him, respond to him surrender to him and I want to pray with you in this moment and if you in your heart desire to be reconciled with this good shepherd if you have seen a picture of his compassion and you realize now that he loves you where you are as I'm praying these words respond in your heart just say yes Jesus be my savior let me pray with you heavenly father today for the person who is Listening to the sound of my voice, I pray that they would hear the promptings of your spirit. I pray that you would touch their heart with the assurance of your salvation and of your grace, of your love and of your mercy. And I pray that you would turn their heart towards you. Lord Jesus, receive them as your son, as your daughter. Give them the inheritance of heaven, the promise of eternal life, and most precious of all, a daily walk and a sense of your presence. So love them, Lord. May they feel it. May they know it. May they hear it in the word of God. May your grace set them free from sin and guilt and shame and all that stuff that holds us back and that is used by the enemy as the lie to stop us from coming to you. Strip it away, Lord, and give them peace with you and salvation. In Jesus' name.